live. And you can go ahead with the video announcements there. Good morning, everyone.
you don't have to be like somebody else. You don't have to copy somebody else's way or somebody else's words, but in your own way and with your own convictions, um, take the time to worship God. Take the time to push away the things that are distracting you and make him uh, front and center for a few moments and sort of clear that spiritual clutter and those concerns and those problems and those pains and whatever it is you're experiencing and focus on him for a few moments. It's so healthy uh, to worship the Lord. forgiveness of sin in our life we thank you that we can have fellowship and relationship with you in the high moments the low moments you are faithful god and we worship you this morning Consecrated 
swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with Take my silver and my gold, not of my good I will do. Take my intellect and use, oh, every power as you choose. Here and prayer this morning. Oh, take my life and it's all for thee. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no and you would shape us, you would mold us, you would make us into your likeness. We would be uh, more and more shaped into the likeness of Jesus in what we say and how we live in our homes and families and marriages and relationships and schools and marketplaces. People would see something of the Savior in our lives. We pray today in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you today. You may be seated. Oh, it's on already. Oh, that's nice when it works the first time. Good morning, everyone, and welcome today. It's great to be with you first, wow, first Sunday in August. So uh, are you still on holiday? Any of you back to school yet? I see young people. Are you back to school yet? For which you are very thankful or unthankful? Thankful. Is mom thankful? She's not answering, okay, <laughs> which, is, which is sometimes normal for parents. But anyway, welcome today, and uh, just a, a couple of really quick announcements before I dismiss the kids. If you are new, either in the room or on the stream, and welcome to those of you who are online today, 
Uh, please do me a favor and use either a guest card in front of you if you're here in the room or the, uh, your phone uh, at home and text the key phrase, reach the one to that phone number and I'll be able to follow up your visit with us. Even if it's electronic, I will do that, okay? One announcement today, really, the rest was on the screen before the service started. Uh, this coming Saturday morning is going to be a hoot, a real blast. Uh, you are going to love it. There's a number of you who are volunteering for the Back to School Bash this year. This is now kind of a post or a pre-COVID crowd, all right? We're expecting in the area of like 300 plus people, uh, probably somewhere around the region of 200 kids are going to come next uh, Saturday morning. So uh, there's, there's three things that you can do. If you're coming to the event with your kids, um, I highly recommend that you come at 8.30 because we hand out uh, the vouchers when we open the doors that are exchanged for school bags and school supplies later. And when we run out of the vouchers, that means we've got no more to give out. So people who come early are, are a lot better off than people who try showing up at 9.30 or even 10 o'clock, okay? So we t tell you to come at 8.30. Now, if you're volunteering in the event, you need to be here by 8.15 a.m. Is that right? Okay, my wife is running the whole thing, and what she will do is give you your tasks the morning of, but don't come later than 8.15. There will be a lineup uh, out the door uh, even at 8 o'clock. It'll probably start, all right? So volunteers, you need to be here at 8.15. If you haven't signed up to volunteer, you can visit with Wedlin at the desk outside at the end. She'll just take your name down, and uh, we'll have you on that list. Now, volunteers, you need to be prepared. So that means you bring a good pair of walking or running shoes, all right? Because you're going to be kind of running around. It's a lot of little jobs, really important small things that have to be done and done well. So get your walking shoes on, bring a little bottle of water or something, but don't bring too much stuff because there's going to be a lot of people here and a lot of activity really quickly, all right? You will see the hallway is going to be jam-packed uh, with kids. So uh, make sure you come no later than 8.15 in the morning. Am I missing anything? Okay, good. So just make sure of that. And if you want to invite people, there's still invitations out in the foyer. And uh, the Facebook post is doing really, really well online. Those of you who have shared, thank you for sharing it. It's moving up to about 50 shares now, okay? So uh, that's all that I have for you this morning. Remember that you can give online at any point in this church, or you can use an envelope in the cup holder in front of you. And uh, you can give that to Wedlin at the end. She'll be outside. We'll make it really, really easy for you today. We're going to dismiss the kids. Uh, Amy is here. Okay, and if you all would follow Amy over to screen 11 and Luciana as well. Yeah, Amy and Luciana today. Great. And uh, enjoy your time over there, kids. And we're going to continue over here with the series that we're doing on uh, the prophets in particular, the prophets from the old or sometimes I'll call it the Older Testament, all right? And I'm going to tell you a really strange story today of two prophets in the Old Testament who don't have names. So this one's called Two Unnamed Prophets. And I picked this story because of the lessons that we learned just from observing these prophets' lives, okay? And this is about 3,000 years ago, this story. But you're gonna, you're, you're, if you've never read the story before, you're going to be like, wow, this is, on the one hand, very disturbing, uh, but on the other hand, very life-changing, okay? Uh, just to review, uh, these prophets that we're going to be looking at are in what we call the monarchy, which is down at the bottom of your screen there. So that's during the period of the kings, kings of Israel, kings of Judah. I'll explain what that means in a moment, but we're looking at two of them. This is not like a, like a written prophet like Isaiah or Ezekiel who wrote material that you're supposed to read. These are prophets who we see them in operation, we see their lives, and we learn things by watching them, okay? And these two that we're going to look at today don't even have names, and we can, we can learn from them, or we don't know what their names are, all right? Now, uh, you're going to, again, see sort of what a prophet is just by watching them and watching what they do. And the context here is really important. The big event of the day, of that time, is the split in the nation of Israel. The civil war that took place 
uh, as it says on your screen there, 922 is really when it culminated. And you can read about this in 1 Kings chapter 11 and 1 Kings chapter 12. It's a, it's a sad story uh, because what happens is that the king of the time uh, when Israel is divided, anybody know who he was? Starts with an S. Solomon, good. So uh, Solomon was whose son? David's son, right. So uh, Solomon is the king at the time, but Solomon makes some really, really bad decisions as a leader of his nation. What bad decisions does he make? Let's test your, your knowledge here. Yeah, he essentially brings idols into the land. Uh, in particular, you've got Moloch, you've got Chemosh. And why does he bring this into, into Israel? Right, because he, he, he's got, uh, got a lot of ladies in his life. A lot of them, and a lot of them are from coming from different religious views, and he incorporates those religious views into his nations. Now, maybe it could be said that a lot of these marriages to these hundreds of wives and so on were political, but all that said, the point is he brings the, this religious, the, all these false religious systems for them into the land and all of these idols and so on, and so... There's going to be trouble and consequences for these decisions. And there's actually a prophet with a name that is going to predict that the kingdom is going to be stripped from Solomon. You can read it in 1 Kings 11 and 12. And it's not going to be stripped from Solomon. It's going to be stripped from Solomon's son, whose name is, starts with an R, Rehoboam. All right, so it's going to be stripped from Solomon's son Rehoboam because of Solomon. And it's going to be given to somebody else to lead. But God, God will say in this prediction, he will say, but I'm going to leave one tribe for the sake of David. There will be one tribe. But the kingdom is going to be stripped from Solomon's son Rehoboam. And we see this take place. So uh, there's a kind of a rebellion that happens. Uh, God raises up several adversaries, really, against Solomon and then against Rehoboam. One of them is named Jeroboam. Okay, I've got a mistake there at the bottom. It says Rehoboam leads Judah and Benjamin. It should be Jeroboam, all right? The, always confuse the Boams. So you're, you'll end up with Rehoboam up in the north, and he's got ten tribes. And Jeroboam, uh, uh, no, I think I've got it reversed. Well, anyway, uh, the, the Battle of the Boams. Yeah, right, uh, so I've got it reversed. So Rehoboam is going to end up with the two down at the bottom. I'm sorry about that, Judah and Benjamin. And Jeroboam is going to lead the top. Okay, good. Oh, I got it correct. Oh, I'm right. Boy, I tell you. I'm, you know what? I need to pause just for a moment and, uh, uh, because I should have done this before. Uh, I really want to say a um, uh, totally different subject. Thank you so much uh, last week. We had, of course, quite a scare in the parking lot uh, where our daughter got sideswiped and bashed by a car that probably was going about 50 kilometers in that parking lot. And as she was pulling into a parking space, she just got smashed on the side. And I really want to thank you, those of you who stuck around and just saw it and drove us around. And she ended up in the hospital and x-rays were negative and so on. And so she's all right. But I mean, we'll see what happens with the car. But uh, it was a hard hit. And I just want to say thank you. It's the church in action and people helping and praying and supporting. We missed the picnic, uh, but I saw the pictures, and you all had a great time, so I'm happy about that. Uh, but thank you so much for your support, and the police were there. They did a great job. The first responders did a great job and everything. So it's nice when it works out that way. Amen? And it was funny, because the, in a way, because the police were asking questions, and they said, who are all these people with you? Is this your family? So, well, this is the church. You know, and they were, they were a little bit surprised, you know, by, wow, all these people around you, you know, that's, that's good. So back to our story here, while I'm, just, while I'm at a point of confusion. So yeah, the kingdom is stripped from Rehoboam, and Jeroboam, the adversary, comes in, and he takes these ten tribes. 
and he leads them. This is up in the north. This is called Israel. Rehoboam is left with just one, Benjamin, along with Judah, and that's where the temple in Jerusalem is. That's my slide is correct, all right? So this is the context. Now what goes on is that down in the south, Rehoboam, again, this is the son of Solomon, kingdom was stripped, uh, it's been given to the adversary, Jeroboam, he's up in the north leading, and down in the south, Rehoboam it has the temple. So the Jews are used to worshiping in the temple. And what happens is that Jeroboam it gets a little bit concerned. Uh, you'll see this in 1 Kings chapter 12, starting in uh, verse 25. He's kind of consolidating his kingdom. And he gets a little bit worried. And he says, well, I've got these ten tribes up, up north, and this is called Israel. But I'm concerned that these people are going to want to go down south to head to that temple and to worship. And I don't want to lose these people. And so what he does is he creates a kind of a pseudo-religious system. And he sets up his own priests. He sets up golden calves. He sets up all this kind of stuff up north so that the people won't go down south to worship. And when you set up golden calves and all of these things, and again, the problem of idolatry, what is he doing? He's being disobedient to God. And you can see this in the chapter. Jeroboam built shrines on high places, appointed priests from all sorts of people, supposed to be Levites, but he just does his own thing. He institutes all these special religious days, and he kind of creates his own religious view uh, mixing some idolatry in there so he can still hold on to the people and lead the people up north. You following me so far? So this would lead to, to uh, king after king after king in the north in Israel would be ungodly. And every single listed king that you read about in 1 Kings, and you'll see this in Chronicles as well, in the north, all of them end up with problems. All of them. In the south, very few are godly, with a few exceptions, one of whom you will learn about today. So that's the context, all right? And we move into chapter 13, and this is where you see these two unnamed prophets. One is referred to as a man of God, probably intentionally, because the first time man of God is used in the Old Testament is for a man by the name of Moses. And here, the, the writer chooses this term to refer to this one unnamed prophet. And the second one is called an old prophet. So intro the story here. The word of the Lord comes to the man of God. And he's from Judah in the, in the south. And he comes from Judah to Bethlehem as Jeroboam was standing by the altar uh, to make an offering. So Jeroboam again has set up this, this weird worship system and this prophet is coming from Judah in the south. He comes up and he sees Jeroboam doing this at the offering. And this is what he says. He makes a bold, bold prediction. He cries out and he sees the altar and he says, O altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. Remember, prophets proclaim on behalf of God. A son named Josiah will be born to the house of David. That's down in Judah. On you he will sacrifice the priests of the high places, harsh, who now make offerings here and human bones will be burned on you. He's speaking to an altar. That same day, the man of God gave a sign. Again, he's got King Jeroboam in front of him. He gave a sign. This is the sign the Lord has declared. The altar will be split apart, and the ashes on it will be poured out. So King Jeroboam, he hears this, and he's not happy. He's upset. And he stretches out his hand from the altar and he says, seize him. Grab this, this prophet. He's got bad news. Grab him. But the hand he stretched out toward the man shriveled up so that he could not pull it back. And also the altar was split apart 
and its ashes poured out according to the sign given by the man of God by the word of the Lord. And so then the king turns around and he says to this unnamed man of God, intercede with the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored. So the man interceded with the Lord and the king's hand was restored and became as it was before. Pause for a moment. You recall the story of Moses. Similar thing happens where the hand turns leprous and then Moses intercede, intercedes and the hand becomes normal again. So this is an obvious reference. This, the writer is trying to liken this man of God somewhat to Moses from the Exodus story. So uh, the, the king is now happy. At least he got his hand back. And he says to the man of God, come to my house and come have a meal with me. I'll give you a gift. Interesting. But the man of God answers. Now, this is where the story starts getting strange. And he says, even if you were to give me half of your possessions, he's talking to a king here, I would not go with you. I'm not going to eat with you. I'm not going to drink water here. For I was commanded by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water or return by the way you came. So he took another road and he did not return by the way he had come to Bethel. You with me so far? All right, so he's going to head back. He's obedient to God. God has him under a vow. He cannot do this. He cannot eat or drink over there. He can't accept gifts over there. His job was to go there and make this prediction about this king to come, Josiah. Now, Josiah is a king that would come about three centuries later. He would come and he would institute some of the most godly reforms in Judah that they had ever seen. And Josiah becomes king as a child. He's not even 10 years old. I think he's 8 or 7 years old when he becomes king of Judah. And he sees the place. He sees the state of Jerusalem. He sees the idols. He sees the mess. And he, and he institutes a revival uh, he brings the Bible back to the land, and he brings about transformation in his land, and he fulfills exactly what this unnamed prophet uh, says about him, but he said it about him 300 years before. So, the, the, fast forward, the, the prophet of God, he, he obeys, and he leaves, and he's on his way. And now you've got prophet number two, and he's called an old prophet. And he's living in Bethel, and his sons come, and they tell him about what happened that day. And uh, they go, and they tell their father about this strange man of God who came from the south, who went up north and had this thing with Jeroboam, and told Jeroboam about it. He says, oh, I'm interested. Which way did he go? And so he shows them which way the guy had taken, and he says, saddle up the donkey, we're going to go and find this unnamed prophet, uh, this man of God. He mounts it, and he finds him uh, um, sitting under an oak tree, we're told, verse 14. And he says, are you the man of God who came from Judah? He says, I am. He says, come home with me and eat. Now remember, the man of God is under a vow. He was commanded by God not to do that. He didn't do it when Jeroboam asked him. Now, a prophet asks him, I cannot turn back and go with you, nor can I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. I've been told by the Lord, and he gives him the command, I've got to go back where I've come from. Now, watch what the old prophet does. Hold on to your, your seatbelt. I, too, am a prophet as you are. And an angel said to me, by the word of the Lord, bring him back with you to your house so that he may eat bread and drink water. And the writer tells us, but he was lying to him. He was lying to him. So the man of God returned with him and ate and drank in his house. Problems are going to come now. And so while they're in the house together, a very strange thing happens. The word of the Lord comes to the old prophet, the one who lied. The word of the Lord comes to him and says, this is what the Lord says. You have defied the word 
of the Lord that he gave you. He commanded you not to do this, and you went and did it. And therefore, here's the consequence. You are not going to be buried when you die. You are not going to be buried in your family's tomb. You say, this is bizarre. Right away, you're saying, I don't like this. How come, how come this is going to happen to the, the prophet who was lied to? And it seems like the liar is getting off. Man of God finishes eating and drinking. Prophet finishes as well, brings him back, saddles him up on his donkey. He goes on his way. He's going to head back south, and guess what happens? A lion attacks him on the road. He loses his life. Then you've got a lion standing there beside the body and his own donkey standing there beside the body. And then the old prophet finds out about it, goes and finds the body, brings the body, and then seems to have respect. And he says, um, uh, let's, let's go and find the man. They go, they find him. He mourns for him. He says, oh, my brother. And he buries him in his own tomb. After burying him, he says to his sons, the old lying prophet says this, when I die, bury me in the grave where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the message he declared by the word of the Lord about Josiah to come will surely come to pass. And that's pretty well the end that you see of these two prophets. You say, what kind of crazy story is this? What do we have to learn from this? Right away, I don't like this. My heart my, is drawn to the prophet who made the prediction about Josiah. And it seems like he, I mean, what's the big deal? He, he, had, he got lied to. And it seems like the prophet who lied gets off scot-free. I don't like this story. This story is disturbing, and that's our kind of initial reaction. I want you to dig a little bit deeper because there's some profound lessons here. Number one, God always remember this because there's going to be times in your life where you think that God is unfair to you. You are going to live through things in life where you're going to say it's not fair. God is not just God is not dealing with this properly. You're going to have times in your life like that. Remember, when you have those times, he always sees way beyond your current circumstance, even the current generation, way beyond that. I mean, here you have this man of God making this prediction. It's 300 years into the future. All these people in this story are going to be in their graves by the time Josiah comes. And yet, he's making this prediction very specific, names the king that will come, Josiah. It's because God sees way, way, way beyond even the time and the generation that you're living in. You seek justice, you seek fairness, yes, that's all good. But when you don't get it, and I guarantee you there's going to be a time in your life where you're going to see that it's not there, remember, God sees, God knows God has an economy and a way that he's going to do this and mete out justice. Sometimes you'll live to see it. Sometimes you won't live to see it, but it's guaranteed he will bring it. He sees way beyond the current generation. You've got to hold on to him even when you think it's not fair because unfairness is going to come, especially sometimes it'll come from anywhere. Anywhere, and that's the next lesson. Here you have a prophet of God. Now, granted, you know, you could say, well, he, he, maybe he's been corrupted by Jeroboam. You know, Jeroboam set up this, this worship system and so on, and so maybe this old prophet who's up in the north has been corrupted by him and whatever. You can come up with any explanation you want. But the fact is, he tempts the man of God. He lies to the man of God. He therefore takes the Lord's name in vain because he said, an angel said to me by the word of the Lord, bring him back, have a meal with him. He's lying. He's taking the Lord's name in vain. He's lying to a prophet. You got one prophet who's lying and one prophet who's going to take the bait. Sometimes temptation Lies, they're going to come from anywhere. 
And it isn't fair. It isn't fair. Some of you, you probably have experiences where you've been lied to by a person in spiritual authority. A priest, a pastor, a teacher, an evangelist. Maybe you've been lied to by someone in authority anyway. A school teacher, uh, who knows what. And this, the person was supposedly trustworthy because of their title. They tempted you. They sinned against you. They lied to you. They deceived you. And it looks to you like they're doing really well in life. You're the one who's hurting. You're the one who's been lied to. It isn't fair. That's right. Temptation doesn't play fair. Lies don't play fair. The, the enemy of our souls doesn't play fair. And sometimes you're going you're gonna to face those moments. So, uh, you know, you can be tempted by people who you thought you were your friends. You can be lied to by people who you thought you, you can be stabbed in the back. And sometimes you look at them and you say, wow, you know, where's, where's God in all of this? It isn't fair. It wasn't fair here. And that's 3,000 years ago. So that's, that could come to you. And remember, lies and temptation, they can come from anywhere. This man had a spiritual title, this old prophet. But he didn't have godly character. Don't equate spiritual title, position. That automatically means someone is godly in their character. Folks, you're not going to be judged by your title. When you stand before God one day, he's not going to say, oh, well, you know, all the pastors, you go stand over here. All the non-clergy, you go stand over here. Uh, and, you know, uh, I have a special sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, unique category uh, because of the title. Uh, no, not exactly. You're judged by your character. And just because you have that title, whatever it may be, it does, it's no guarantee of character. And in fact, people who teach, the scripture says, will be judged more strictly. Why? Because there's people following them. Sometimes a lot of people are following them. And so when a teacher lies, when a preacher lies or tempts or leads with corruption... Actually, the scripture says there's a higher judgment because there are people following. So the title is no guarantee of the character. And here you see it interestingly displayed because verses uh, 7 to 9, you've got King Jeroboam. This is a man of standing. This is a man of authority. And the prophet will not eat with him. The man of God says, no, I'm under a vow. I, will, I am not going to eat with you. And Jeroboam lets him go. He's the king, and he defies the king's wish. And yet you have a man who claims to have heard from an angel and who is a prophet of God, yet he lies. Who's got the better character? One could argue that there, Jeroboam did. At least Jeroboam didn't lie, but here the prophet of God lies. Is that not true, folks? Sometimes you even see it in spiritual settings, in churches, in communities of faith. Sometimes you see people who look, there's, look so religious and so spiritual and so perfect. Folks, it's no, the outer appearance is no guarantee of what's really going on inside of a person's life and in their personal life. And in the, when no one is looking, you see. So in a way, Jeroboam at least isn't lying. But the prophet was. Young people, listen to me. It is no guarantee just because a person has a title. You've got to understand that your character is, is of far greater importance before God than whatever... Uh, cultural or worldly success you achieve in life, God is interested in your character and in your integrity. And that's who you are when no one is watching. That's who God sees. That's what God sees. And that's who you are. Whether you're a king or a prophet, and this is good for young people as well, 
when you break God's commands, there are consequences. Consequences can come in many ways. We've seen this theme looking at the prophets over and over and over again. Sometimes those consequences are immediate. Sometimes those consequences aren't even in this lifetime. But they will come. Here you have a prophet, a man of God, who loses his life prematurely. We're left to assume that the, that the lion that takes his life did so because of his disobedience to God. I mean, we can be upset and we can say it's not fair, but the man was under a vow. He is a prophet of God, a man of God. He's under a vow and he takes the bait when someone throws out the angel card and people do this all the time today. I, I heard from the Lord, an angel spoke to me. And what they say, does it line up with the scripture? Does it line up with with what God has already told us in his word. I've heard it so many times. Someone claims they've got a word from the Lord, a message from God, an angel told me. How do you argue with an angel? Right? You know what I do when people do this? They say, well, tell me, what the, tell me what the message is. Do I find it in the scripture? Wow, I'm looking. I don't see it anywhere. It doesn't line up with the scripture. You see? So whether king or prophet, the prophet loses his life, likely, prematurely, because of his flat-out, willful disobedience against God. He took the bait because somebody threw out the angel card and the I'm a prophet card. He takes the bait. What happens to the king, Jeroboam? Well, you read the back end of the chapter, and you see that Jeroboam, because he sets up this false worship system, even after this, uh, verse 33, Jeroboam did not change his evil ways, but once more appointed priests from the high places, from all sorts of people. Anyone who wanted to become a priest, he consecrated for the high places, not supposed to do that, against the law of Moses. This was the sin of the house of Jeroboam that led to its downfall and to its destruction from the face of the earth. And you can read about that in chapter 14. You will see what happens to Jeroboam and to his household. It is devastating what happens. But he can't make an excuse either. God had told him, you have to lead this way. This is the way that you are to live. You are to be godly like David was. This is the way that you have to live. And you'll be blessed if you lead that way and if you live that way. What does he do? He goes against the command of God. What happens? The consequences come. What happens to the man of God who breaks the vow that God put him under, willfully breaks it, even though he was lied to? Yes. Even though he was deceived? Yes. He took the bait because he respected the so-called prophet of God more than God himself. And he pays the price, a terrible price in a sense. You meet these two later on in Josiah's time. Josiah will say, what's this grave over here? And the people will tell them, this is where that prophet is buried who made the prediction that you would come. And Josiah says, leave it alone. And he has respect for this. Um, so you, 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 one thing you have to get if, you get if you get anything from this message, and there's so much in it, but one thing you have to get, and it's, a, it's a, the message that keeps coming from prophet after prophet after prophet that we look at. Wow, those consequences are something. And if you want to know what God is saying to you, when God gives you a command and he tells you to do something, you want to know how to know, you've got to check it up against his word. And this prophet made a dreadful mistake. The word of God that he clearly heard and clearly defended in front of the king, he dismissed because of a man who said that he heard from an angel. So we've got the word of God today. 
And when, when you get a clear lock on something from the Scripture that tells you, and I'm not talking about some obscure text or some weird doctrine that you fished out of, you know, some tiny little verse somewhere. I'm talking about when God tells you something and it's crystal, crystal clear. Do what He says. Young people, if He says, don't go eat over there, don't go drink over there, do what I told you to do and come back home. Do what God says. Do what he says. Don't compromise it. Don't change it. Don't fiddle around with it. Do what he says. When you know that you've heard from him, and the way that you do is by checking in this book, when you know that you have heard from him, do what he says. Whether you're a king, whether you're a prophet, it doesn't matter. Spiritual title does not always mean godly character. These lies, these temptations can come from anywhere. It's not always fair. And remember, when you don't like it, when you feel it's unfair, God sees way beyond the current generation. Would you stand with me? We're going to close the service in prayer. Musicians, you can come and uh, get ready to go ahead and start playing whatever you want, and we can close the service uh, with that music playing in the background. Let me pray with you today. It's a strange message, I know, a bizarre message, one that you need to probably reread a couple of times to digest it. But wow, the, the practical lessons of walking and operating in your relationship with God are just falling out of this story. Father, I pray for each person who's in the room today, young people, seniors, people in families, married, kids, grandkids, whoever. Lord, I pray for those watching online, those who are going to watch, those who are going to listen to audio later. In the name of Jesus, Lord, there's simple truths here. And sometimes it's so tough for us to just follow the line that you, that you clearly place before us. Sometimes, God, we get distracted. Sometimes we get deceived. Sometimes we, we place more value in what people say than what you say. Just so many things. Help us, Lord. Help us to clear the clutter and to be obedient to you, to live with godly character above all things we pray together today in jesus name amen amen the lord bless you today remember if you are volunteering for saturday's event to make sure that you show up no later than 8 15 in the morning if you want to volunteer haven't signed the list you can visit with wedline in the foyer have a great sunday remember to pick up your kids in screen 11 on the way out god bless you today Thank you.